Okay, good afternoon, everybody. As we know, um, we're in the Gospel of Luke, and now we're in Chapter 8. We're in the second part of Chapter 8. Well, I mean, it'll be our second lesson from Chapter 8. And we're up to verse 19. And we see that, I mean, we're in the ministry of Jesus Christ. We're going through what he went through as Luke is portraying it, the author of the book. And he did a lot of investigating to make sure that he could, you know, provide good information, you know, to his audience. And in chapter one, we saw that, you know, his audience, there's a name for it, you know, but the, we don't know if that's an individual or a group of people, but uh, he wrote to them, you know, this story. And so we investigated it. And, and that's what we're studying. We're seeing what Luke was able to capture and bring into the picture. And in some cases, Luke covers some things that Matthew and Mark or John don't cover. And uh, and some in some cases, he covers something that one of the other authors in the Gospels covered. And in some cases, they didn't. Now, what what we're up to now is we've we've seen that Jesus teaches in parables. We've seen that he depends on others to help him with his ministry. I mean, and if you ever watch in The Chosen, I mean, they make a pretty good uh, case of that, like in uh, the, the season two segments. You know, in the season two part, they talk about what Jesus did and those that went with him and those that helped him and how they helped him and and the things Jesus did and how Jesus depended on others and also worked with others to carry out his ministry and his mission. And in and through that, that's where he demonstrated, you know, the power of God being God himself. But he gave up a lot of his glory to become a human being. But we see that he is function. Last week, we saw that he even explained to his disciples why he taught in parables. Those those parables just aren't understandable by every single individual. You know, he said, basically, they have to have ears to hear and eyes to see to be able to understand the parables. And he said to his disciples that to you, it has been given to understand. And so we see that Jesus even explained the, uh, the parables to his disciples. So, so we see that as his ministry is going on, he's developing his disciples. I mean, he's there for them. In a sense, you can kind of see how we have the Holy Spirit in us. He is God in us, helping us along. He's the other helper that Jesus asked the Father for back in John 17 for us. And he talks about the Holy Spirit in 15 and 16, John 15 and 16 also. But back then, Jesus, the Son, was the one who was interacting with those that were his disciples. Now, today, it's the Holy Spirit who interacts you know, with us internally. We are the temple, his temple. So, I mean, does that mean we don't interact with Jesus? No, of course we do. But we do it through the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. So if the Holy Spirit's in us, we have access directly to the Father and the Son through the Holy Spirit, because he is one. So, and through Jesus Christ, that's how we have our forgiveness and our salvation, right? Because we repent and we walk with him through the power of the Holy Spirit to become more Christ-like. So we're going to pick up now, and what we're going to see is we're going to see how Jesus identifies the folks in the world. And we're even going to talk some about, uh, you know, maybe spiritual warfare a bit. We're going to see what Jesus does in that arena. And so we're going to see that Ephesians 6, for instance, that talks about spiritual warfare for us, where we need to put on the armor of God daily. And because we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers of, you know, the heavenlies, the unseen realm, that's a reality. Well, we'll even see Jesus dealing with that, too. So any questions on the introduction or anything, any questions about what we've had in Luke so far, maybe that have been niggling at your mind and are like, I don't really know what this is all about. Feel free to ask. Was Luke Jewish? Uh, it's believed that Luke was uh, Gentile.
that he came from there. That's why he addresses Theophilus. Some believe that he uh, he might have been a Hellenistic Jew, but some believe that he was just straight up a Gentile. I don't know. He was one or the other. <laughs> So he could have been he could have been Jewish, you know, but Hellenistic maybe, but not not necessarily, you know, like right there in Israel because he he wasn't with Jesus, you know. It's not like he ended up traveling with Jesus like his like the apostles did, for instance. Yeah, he learned all his secondhand. Right, he got most of his from Paul. Remember that because he traveled with Paul. That's who Luke traveled with, and he was like his physician. You know, because Luke the physician kind of thing. So that's why it's believed he may have been a Hellenistic Jew or he may have just been straight up a Gentile. One or the other. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together and study your word. I pray, dear Holy Spirit, that you would open up our hearts and minds to hear and understand what it is that you have for us, to know what you want to teach us today, that we would walk in your righteousness in a way that honors and glorifies you. We praise you and we thank you. We give you the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let me share out the scriptures here and we'll jump right on in. Okay, what we're looking at, we're in, like I said, Luke chapter 8. And we're up to verse 19. Now, some would look at this little piece of this segment that Luke captures and would say, why is this important? But it has value. Let's read verses 19 through 21. Listen to what it says, starting verse 19. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, hey, your mother and your brothers are standing outside desiring to see you. But he answered them, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. Now, some would look at that and say, what? What's up with this? Or what value did Luke think this would present to those who were going to be reading it? But what we have to understand in the world today, we have a worldly construct. And I mean, I'm not saying that it's wrong, you know, to look to your family. I mean, our family is important. God is a God of relationships and our family should be a principal relationship in our lives. We should work with our families and whatnot. It's important to have good relationships. I mean, God makes that clear. But one of the things that happens here, the others are seeing it. And basically, in a sense, they're taking the focus off what is important onto something that is less important. I'm not saying that, hey, his mother and his brothers coming to see him was unimportant. But the thing is, is that what he's saying is, I'm in the process of sharing the good news. I'm in the process of telling heavenly things. And he's saying those are the important things. And the people that are here hungry for what I'm talking about in terms of the godly things, the spiritual things, they are the ones that are here to hear the word of God and to put it into practice. And in that sense of the word, that one is more important than the relationships that we have here on this earth. Not that, again, not that relationships are on this earth are unimportant. They're important. But one of the things, too, that we understand, he didn't need a distraction from what it was that he was doing at the time. In other words, for all intents and purposes, he could be saying, hey, let them sit down and also enjoy what I'm saying. We can see, though, that his brothers, you know, his family, now uh, not so much Mary, but his, his brothers and sisters were not real followers of Jesus while he was alive. I mean, they kind of had some questions about him and maybe just saw him more as somebody trying to do a power play, something that was just, hey, I just want the attention. They kind of saw him in that light, not as the son of God, not as the Messiah, but as uh, as an individual that probably was in it more for himself than for others. 
So in a sense, I think Jesus understood that at this point in time too, that right at this point, they weren't. Now, in the scriptures, there are two uh, New Testament uh, epistles, the epistle of Jude and the epistle of James. And it is believed that James and Jude were two of Jesus's actual brothers. I mean, half brothers, because obviously they would have been born of Joseph and Mary. Um, but of course, Jesus was born by God through Mary. So in essence, because Jesus though was adopted by Joseph, in essence, they were all family. And so he knew his brothers, he knew them, and they knew him, or at least in the way that they knew. Now, his mom, on the other hand, did know him better. I mean, she actually guided Jesus into his ministry. We see that even from the time when he was 12 years old, if you remember when we were reading in chapter two about when he went to Egypt, when they went to Egypt to flee Herod, who was killing the children and because God told him to, and then they came back. I mean, we even see there when he was in the temple at 12 years old that he stayed. He thought that it was his time to start his ministry. But basically, Joseph and Mary said, nah, not your time yet. Come home. And he went back with him. So he thought that was the time for him. It wasn't until he got to the miracle at the wedding of Cana that she finally said, hey, do whatever he tells you. He thought it wasn't his time, but that was really the opening salvo of his ministry. And it was Mary who ushered him into it. So as we look at this, we realize that there is a difference in the world, you know, and we need to understand that those who hear the word of God, who read it, who study it and put it into practice, those are the family of God. Those are really the ones who truly are in him, who have come to saving grace. And then there are others, you know, that are out there that, hey, may, they've got other priorities. And so, and when you look at that, you realize not everybody who will say to Jesus on that day, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. Because that if they truly aren't committed and have given their lives to the Lord and surrendered to him to be Lord of their lives, they can say, Lord, Lord, all they want. But if they did not turn over their heart to him, they're not listening. They're not carrying out what God wanted them to do. Their hearts haven't changed. They have not been born again to be transformed, as Romans 12, 2 talks about. They're still conformed to this world, basically, is what it is, not being transformed. So that's the difference that Jesus is trying to bring out here, that there is a separation. To follow Christ, you will be different. You will be separate. You will obey what God wants you to do instead of just saying, oh, I'm here for the entertainment value. Because, hey, I guarantee you many people follow Jesus just for the entertainment value of what he was doing not really turning their lives over to him and following him as a disciple, but as, as just somebody, hey, look at all this stuff that's happening. I want to be able to say I was there and I saw it and I got his autograph, you know, and I'm wearing the t-shirt now. But if their heart hasn't been turned and transformed, then basically they haven't fallen into this family of God where Jesus talked about my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. So that's what he's bringing out in these three verses, that there is a reality in being in Christ Jesus that takes precedence over everything. And in another scripture, he talks about that, hey, unless you hate your mother and father and your brother and sisters, you cannot be my disciple. And again, he's not talking about real hatred in the sense of hating because that's not what we're called to. We're called to love everybody, right? Love God first and love neighbors ourselves. What he's talking about there is that our love should be so devoted to God that in comparison to the things of this world and those things that are not of God, it would seem like we hate that. It's not that we hate. It's mm -hmm. that we love God above all. And that's what's important. So any questions on verses 19 through 21 about who we are in Christ Jesus and how that sets us apart? in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so let's move on to 
uh, verse 22. Now Luke captures another miracle of God. Now remember, Peter, James, John, and some of the other disciples were fishermen. That's what they understood. So they understood about taking a boat out on the Sea of Galilee. And now if you look at the construction of how the Sea of Galilee is, it's kind of like it's in this deep chasm with mountains all around. So because when the wind blows and because of the way wind goes faster in the bottom, because it has to meet up with the wind that's going over the top, some pretty drastic storms could happen in the Sea of Galilee. And they could get pretty severe, enough to where it could overturn boats and cause a lot of problem to these fishermen that are out there if they're get caught in one of those storms. So as you keep that in mind, it's not that these guys aren't educated on how to be able to get out there in the boat and navigate some of the storms, but some of them could be very, very severe to where it just even overwhelmed them. So let's let's take a look at this. Uh, verse 22 and following, it says, One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Hey, let's go across to the other side of the lake. Now, if you remember, uh, well, let me see if I can bring up a map here. Uh, just to kind of point out some stuff here. Okay, let me zoom in here to, to Galilee, or to the Sea of Galilee here. Okay, now, as we see here, this is the Sea of Galilee. Uh, let me zoom in a little more. Okay, this is the Sea of Galilee here. Now, it, we they don't give me all the cities here in this map, but in other words, Capernaum, Bethesda, uh, Bethsaida, I mean, are all up in this area, okay? On this side, this is Samaria, Samaria. You know, like where the Samaritans were, you know how the Jakes, the Jews hated Samaritans. They were on this side. Now, this is the sea, uh, the Jordan River coming down on the south out of the Sea of Galilee. Now, over on this side, this is what was known as the Decapolis. In other words, there were 10 big Gentile uh, cities, you could say, or, you know, areas where Gentiles live, big townships. They were on this side over here. So this is all mainly Gentile land. And now Jesus is over on this side, probably up here in this area. Um, and so he's he's going to go across the, the sea. From, uh, here's Gennesaret. Here's Tiberias. And later they renamed this Sea of Tiberias, by the way. But he's crossing over to this other side. He's going to a Gentile area in, for all intents and purposes. And the question, you know, why was he going to a Gentile area, you know? But that's what he's doing. They're crossing this sea, trying to get over there, because that's what Jesus wants to do. So then he says, so let's get into, the, he got into boat with his disciples, said to them, let's go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out. And as they sailed, notice that Jesus can, he's at peace all the time. He can fall asleep in a boat. He can just, you know, take it easy. Nothing really bothers him, okay? He's got God. I mean, he's the man God, God man, and he's got God on his side. He has nothing to fear. So, hey, in, in these type of situations, hey, he's taken, he's taken some time just to rest up. So he falls asleep in the boat. And notice what happens. Like I was saying, in Galilee, the Sea of Galilee, this can happen really quickly that a storm can just all of a sudden pop up and it can be severe. So it says, and a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water and were in danger. In other words, hey, the waves were big. The water was coming over the gunner, a gunwale, so that it was filling with water. So they're obviously bailing like crazy trying to get the water out. While Jesus is still kind of asleep, he's probably getting wet, but hey, he's taking a snoozer. In verse 24, and they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Now, for these guys who were familiar with the Lake of the Sea of Galilee, for them to say we're perishing, this was a severe storm. I mean, this was something beyond their abilities. But notice, at least they went to Jesus, right? <laughs> and said, hey, Master, we need you, right? 
And so Jesus, uh, here we see, and he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased. In other words, hey, is Jesus, you know, over all? I mean, now granted, he gave up his glory, but hey, he still has the power of the Holy Spirit in him. And he's got God's direction and guidance. He has his power to be able to do these things. And so he, he rebukes the wind and the raging waves. They cease, and there was calm. Okay? So then, notice, he doesn't lay back down to continue his nap. Instead, he says to them, now this is a lesson time. Notice this is a lesson time. He said to them, where is your faith? Now, understand this. Jesus is God with him. Now, as I said earlier in the introduction, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. That is God with us, okay? He's with us all along. And Hebrews, Hebrews uh, says that he will never leave us or forsake us, right? Hebrews 13, 5. So we know that God is always with us. And God, it is through God and his workings in and around us and through us that our faith is developed. Now, think about it. From an external perspective, now, they don't have the Holy Spirit in them yet. Okay, that's still to come in Pentecost. And I know there, God, Jesus gives them some opportunity to be able to experience the power of God when he breathes on them. But the filling of the Holy Spirit doesn't come until Pentecost. But yet, notice that even so, Jesus is saying, even without the Holy Spirit, he's still saying that at least they should have some measure of faith, having been with him and seeing what he's done before. In other words, to some extent, he's saying, hey, you could have just trusted me. And through me, you could have been able to say, hey, you know, peace be still, just like I did. But so he's asking, him, where is your faith? Uh, and, and King James, I think it says, oh, ye of little faith. In other words, you know, your faith was more in waking me up than really dealing with the situation as it was, the storm of life, so to speak, right? So, so they say, what's your faith? Now, think about it. If you were the one in their shoes and you had never really had an experience with God other than what you're seeing somebody else has done because God was working through them, and all of a sudden they would say to you, hey, man, you know, because of the situation that maybe they were able to deal with with no problem, but you weren't able to deal with. And they say, why didn't you trust God? Think about how you would be in that position. I'm sure they were scratching their heads like, uh, what's faith got to do with anything? We had a storm, man. <laughs> it was bad and we were about to drown. So, hey, we just needed to wake you up. And so God did what he did through Jesus Christ. But they, I don't think they really understood yet what Jesus was saying when he was asking them about their faith. They were like, man, okay, I'm sure they were happy that the storm was gone, but, you know, I, I don't think they grasped yet what this faith thing was all about. And notice, because once he asks them about that, notice what how they were, and they were afraid, okay? In other words, uh, I'm not really going to focus on the faith thing I'm just focused that, hey, man, praise, thank you that we're saved now and we're alive. So they marvel, saying to one another, okay? So in other words, now their focus is on him, which is good. It should have been all the time, right? But they're saying to one another, who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water and they obey him? I, I really like John 1. You know, right at the beginning, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. And then if you jump down a little bit, it says everything that was created was created by him and through him and through him were all things made. So when you look at that, you realize Jesus, that person, even though he was, he came and gave up his glory to be a human being, that Jesus is the creator of all the universe and they probably didn't even realize you know who jesus truly was you know they couldn't ex i don't think they had a grasp of the fact that they were with the creator of all the universe and as colossians 1 16 and 17 talks about and it's through jesus that all creation holds together so think about it 
and even in his human form, there was a power in and through God in him to hold all of the universe together. I mean, and for all intents and purposes, if the sun was to let go, all creation could be disbanded because it's all in his control, under his control. Now, don't ask me to explain that because I know that as a human being, he didn't have everything that he had when he was in his God form, total God form. But he was in a God man form and we know he had to give up much of his glory to do what he did. So obviously he's relying on the father a lot as he's going through this. So, but imagine that if you were there with those guys, these fishermen, and saw Jesus and heard Jesus command the waves and the seas to be still, be calm, and it happened, boy, wouldn't that have been an amazing thing? It's like, man, alive, you know? And yet, the Lord calls us to trust him in all things, you know, and even though they're very impressed with what Jesus did, don't think that this was enough to bring them totally about. Now, they've already seen miracles. We've seen that above. But now this one, man, this one here is like, my goodness, this is like having control of creation itself. And that's what he is displaying here. So I, I think if we were there, we've been pretty freaked out too, okay? I think we would have been, and they were afraid. I think we would have been right in that. <laughs> we would have been right there with them. And uh, we would have been marveling too, you know what I mean? So any questions about who Jesus is and his power over all of creation? And obviously, through God the Father and the Holy Spirit, he's... In his God-man form, he was able even to control the elements, you know. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. You know, the question is here, you, you would think why they they were afraid, right? You would think, okay, <laughs> they, 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 this, this is a storm. Right. Uh, Christ calms the storm, everything is fine. Hey, praise the Lord. But that's not their reaction. Nope. So remember... Uh, I mean, they have seen miracle, right? And mm -hmm. other ones we have studied before. Mm -hmm. But I can't think, what's the word now? I cannot think when someone is different than who you are. That's a word I can think of it now. Uh, when, you, when people are afraid of, of all the human beings that they're not, they, they are different. Yeah, man. I know I know anyway, what you're talking anyway, about. Anyway, that, that word. So, yeah. so, so, the, so here's the point. Uh they know basically that Christ is, 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 is the son of God, right? He claim, he basically claims to be God. Amen. But to see that, you know, it's to, to it, it, if we put ourselves there <laughs> and, and, the, <laughs> and, and the shoes of the disciple, imagine we're there. Oh, right? man. And we see the storm. This, this, if we're so afraid and someone comes out of nowhere and says, cease, and everything got calm. Amen. That he has power over nature. Amen. But well, that's what got them so scared. It's like, who is this man? That <laughs> even the storm listened to him. Yeah. Amen. It's like, how, how can someone deny that Christ is God, that he's the son of God? How, yeah, how, how can you read that and say, well, he, he's just another man? Oh, you know what? That That's all lie. Oh, that, that, they, they invented those things. How do we know that that's true? Right. Because you you just you speak to people. Oh, I said, do you know what the Bible says? Can, can you show me anyone on this earth that claim to be God who have power over nature? Amen. Because you know you could you you have a situation with let's, let's say with with money you could pay someone. But when, can you negotiate with nature? <laughs> can anyways no say to nature there's a hurricane coming and i say you know what i will pay a million dollars that i have if you don't touch my house can anyone <laughs> negotiate with we, we cannot we don't have no. that power amen to see someone that had power over nature that's what got them so scared who amen. is this man yeah they probably, they're probably not they're still not 100 percent that christ right. is god amen well in terms of what martin's saying Notice that where they're going, they're going over to the Gentile area, right? They're going over to the other side of Sea of Galilee. 
And guess who one of the main gods is over there? Baal. Baal is one of those gods, but he's considered a god like of the seas and that kind of thing. So think about it. Nobody that worshipped Baal had ever seen something like what Jesus did, yet supposedly anyone that worshipped Baal was supposed to go to Baal, and Baal would be able to do something like that. See the issue here? I think to some extent they're like, oh my, you know? And because, hey, they would have been exposed to these other gods. It's not like, you know, they were living like Israel was this wonderful place where all they did was worship Jehovah God. They knew about the gods of the nations around them. And they, in some cases, many of them even, you know, worshiped some of those gods. Baal was one of them. So you can see that when they see this, they also are acknowledging that God is over this Baal. You know, to the land where they're going, one of the gods that the people worship. So, uh, yeah, like Martin says, man, I think I think we would have been freaked out too. Yeah, go ahead, brother Martin. You know, I just had a discussion this week. Someone who's from from England, he's uh -huh. right. He claims to be an agnostic mm -hmm. and, and an atheist at the same time. Oh my! <laughs> and I asked him, <laughs> okay, what what is an agnostic? Ah, uh, you know, he gave me an explanation. I said, listen. An agnostic, a simple an agnostic is this, is this, is this. You have a you have a plate on, in front of you, like someone said, you have burgers and you have french fry and, and you have a drink and it, it's in front of you, but you say, you know what, I see it, but I don't recognize it. That's it. Right. You know what I mean? It basically it's a fool. It's like right. you have something in front of you, but you don't want to recognize that it's there. But and, and again, it's like okay, he tells me, oh, the, the Bible is full of contradiction, right? <laughs> I don't believe the Bible because it's full of contradiction. I said, uh -huh. okay, name me one contradiction. And we got into some other discussion, discussion which I, I don't know what, <laughs> what other contradiction basically didn't say anything. Yeah. yeah. But I said, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what is the basic, what, the, the, <laughs> what is the gospel? Because, you know, you'd be surprised when you talk to people that have a, a, a lot of misconception about the Bible. Amen. Things that the, basically the Bible doesn't say. I was talking to a, 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 a a Muslim, he said, Christ never claimed to be God. Oh, oh, oh. That. so that that's that's what I don't know why he learned that. I said, right. then you need to read the Bible because yeah. it's sort of the opposite. Amen. Yep. Yeah, I'm telling you, that's that's the world today, isn't it, Martin? It, it sure is. But you know, I, I, at least let's like, if you're gonna make it, like they say, a statement is either true or false. Amen. Amen. So if you make a statement today. You you gotta make sure you're saying this the right thing because you have otherwise you have you have you have false information. Exactly. Exactly. No, good point. Good point. So any questions on this area where Jesus, you know, shows control over nature, as Martin said. Amen. Okay. So now let's get into the area that I mentioned earlier about spiritual warfare. Don't think that spiritual warfare is something that was old and now is new. Yeah, go ahead, Brian. Before we go on, let's, yeah, go and now how we apply that, you know, this verse to, to our life. Okay. Well, we got to remember that we have a Savior. Amen. Okay, that died in the cross. He died for us. He has redeemed us. Amen. But on top of that, this verse tells us that he's in control over nature. Everything. So if we have a situation where, you know, Listen, when hurricane comes, just pray. Amen. Pray for, 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 for God to protect our house. If Amen. it happens, if it's his will, you will be untouched. If Amen. God allows to happen, it happens. But if it's if it pleases God, the hurricane could come by and your house could be protected. Amen. Because the God that we serve is over nature. Amen. He, he controls nature. So it's That's not just a, something that happened in the past. Right. This applies today. Amen. Christ, Christ hasn't changed. No, he hasn't. So whatever situation we have in with the, even even the, with, with nature, we gotta pray. Amen. And believe. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Margaret even brought up earlier that we want to pray about these hurricanes that are coming, like barrel that's out there now in the Caribbean, you know. So yeah, we'll be praying. Absolutely. I God's have a huge storm right now. <laughs> what's that? I'm just kidding. Oh. I have a huge storm right now. I'm not <laughs> kidding about the storm, but I'm just saying it's right. What's your joke. storm, Gene? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one, man. We're getting drenched. 
oh my goodness, bring it over this way, Gene. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. That, that's a that's a good storm, by the way. Amen. <laughs> that's not Amen. bad. <laughs> we need the rain. Yeah, Amen. absolutely. Those, those are blessings. Amen. That's right. Okay. So let's move on now to the area of spiritual warfare. Hey, believe me, spiritual warfare has been here all the way from Satan when he tempted Eve at the in the garden. Did you know that that was spiritual warfare? Good against evil, right? God's direction, God's order against the lives of Satan. Unfortunately, we bit and ate the fruit, and here we are today dealing with it. And ever since then, we've we've had there's gonna it was spiritual warfare ever since then. So Jesus now remember he said he wanted to go to the other side of Galilee, right? So he's on he they're on their way. The seas are calm now. And it says, then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes. On the map I showed you, it's the one on the on the um, eastern side of the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. And so, yeah, eastern. I'm pretty sure that's eastern, right? To the Gerasenes, which is the opposite Galilee. Galilee was on the other side. Then Jesus had stepped out on land. There, when he, Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. Now notice, this dude doesn't just have one demon. This dude is has more than one demon, okay? He's got multiple. And for a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house, but among the tombs. So, I mean, obviously, he is really deeply disturbed and possessed and problematic, okay? I mean, when Satan is in a person... We don't know how he got possessed, but the bottom line is he's possessed. And most of the time, the possession back in that time by Satan or his, well, I should say by his demons, is because of idol worship. Remember, idols were really a representation of satanic demons. And so in essence, when they were worshiping these idols, in essence, they were worshiping demons. And then by worshiping them, that opens you up to possession by them. And that's probably how it happened with this guy. Because remember, this is Gentile town now. The Gentile area, that's what they're familiar with. They're familiar with all their gods. That's what they worship. And that's why many of them were demon-possessed. So in verse 28, when he saw Jesus, notice that the demons control his understanding and everything. Because it says when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Notice, he's being controlled by these demons. The demons know Jesus. Isn't that what we see Paul wrote about? That even the demons, you know, uh, know, uh, know God and, you know, they shudder. They know the name of God. They shudder. In other words, what we see is that, you know, I mean, these demons through this guy recognize Jesus, the son of the most high God, even in his human form. Notice that they recognize Jesus in the way he is. So apparently there is something about Jesus that from the spiritual realm, they can see and and clearly identify that this individual called Jesus is the son of God, the most high. So now, remember, his, these disciples that are with him in the boat have heard this and seen this. Hopefully, this is something they remember, right? Hey, wait a minute. What's this guy saying? This is Jesus, the son of the most high God? Oh, man. So notice what the guy, which is the demon speaking to him. I beg you, do not torment me. Now, notice, it's not the individual that is saying this. Don't torment me. It is the demon, the demons that are in him that are requesting that. Okay? Because they're the ones that are really got control of this individual's body. Because look what happened. The reason is because in verse 29, for Jesus, he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Now, what does that tell you? Not only did we see that Jesus has control over nature, but Jesus has control of spiritual forces, right? He, he told him, hey, come out of the dude. Leave him alone. 
And that was all he had to say, right? Yeah, go ahead, Brother Martin. Yeah, we could see that once once a a, a demon uh, takes possession of a person, they lose their willpower. That's it's, it. It's, it's like a puppet. You being yep. control, amen. Total control. So it, it's scary because the person is no longer in control of himself. Exactly. And that's why the Bible, you know, warns us: stay away, stay away from the occult. Amen. And those people that play around with it, they don't realize once they open the door, like we have discussed before. Yep. That's it. They 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 are they are basically in a vulnerable position. Very vulnerable. Yep. Amen, brother. So I mean, this guy, think about it. We already saw just as it was opening, he's been among these tombs for so long, they've been causing him to be out there in the nude the whole time, you know, running around these graves, these, you know, that were there. So Jesus frees the man, says, Hey, come out of the man. For now, we see that this is something that some scrolls have, but not all scrolls have. It says, for many a time, it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. So, hey, we can see, just as Martin said, he's being totally controlled by these, the, this, de this demonic force that is in him. But notice, the guy, the demon hasn't come out yet kind of still wants an interaction with Jesus, wants to, I, you know, discuss matters first, okay? Because then, in verse 30, it says, Jesus then asked him, okay, what is your name? Notice, Jesus has the power to question the individual, th those possessing the individual. So he's asking him what his name is. And the, de the demon, or the demonic force said, legion for many demons had entered him okay so in other words legion is a big number right so but that's what they called themselves was legion so it wasn't just one demon in there it was probably hundreds of demons that were in this guy i mean he was totally out uh, i mean totally at their mercy for many demons had entered him verse 31 and they begged him now notice this Notice what the demons do, knowing that Jesus is the son of the living God, the most high God. Notice they understand something really big that sometimes we don't give the Lord credit for, and we should. Because he is overall, and it says, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Well, what, what is the abyss? Would you say that it's the lake of fire? Because isn't that where Satan and the beast and the Antichrist and all of them are going to be thrown into at the end? It's it's where their final torment will be. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Martin. According to the book of Jude, they are they are demons. Yep. They are in prison right now. Yeah. The reason that you know the my only explanation that I guess they were so powerful. That God did not let them loose. They are according to the book, they are in chain until judgment day. That's so it. Those, 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 uh, those demons are not here. That's it. They're I mean, yeah. they're under God's judgment already. Yeah. Amen. Amen, brother. So, as you can see, they don't want to go to their final destination that God's already ordained, judged them to go to, because they're saying, Hey, wait a minute. So we don't want to go yet. Now, notice this. I mean, Jesus even shows compassion to these demons. Because he doesn't, I mean, obviously he had the power to do it. Because if, if he, why would they ask him not to if he didn't have the power, right? So he obviously has the power to be able to cast them into the abyss already. Their judgment's already been sealed. But yet there's a period of time that God is allowing Satan to be the prince of the power of the air and, and the demonic forces that aren't locked and chained outside of this place, the place that's already for them. They're they're busy in the world doing things that, you know, are messing people up, just like this poor man uh, over in the garrisons. So they're begging Jesus, hey, don't send us into the abyss. But notice, notice what they look for. Apparently, they can possess other things, animals, they can possess humans, 
and probably they can just float around until they find somebody or some someone willing that they can possess. Because now, based on everything that I see scripturally, they can't just possess you for possessing you, say. You have to kind of make yourself available or vulnerable. Now, some say, well, wait a minute, what about the children that were possessed? And I think that's because the parents were possessed, they, the children could be possessed. Now, I mean, that's grasping at straws a bit because I've seen, you know, in scripture where that happens. But the thing is, is what you realize is you don't want to mess with satanic forces because when you mess with them, you open yourself up to a lot of problems. And so it can be even a family related thing, right? Because in a way, remember when Paul, you know, ended up uh, being where the jail was broken open, I think it was in Philippi, and and remember the jailer came to him, thought they had escaped and was about to kill himself. And Paul said, don't kill yourself. We're all here. You know, none of us have gone anywhere. And he took him in, cleaned them up. And the jailer cleaned them up and, and then asked how they could be saved. And notice that it, when he got saved, it was he and all his family that were saved. So obviously he had influence and power over his family so that all were saved. And in a sense, you can kind of see that here like in demonic forces, that if you as a family open yourself up to it, your family can get possessed too. So you got to be careful. I mean, when you're playing with spiritual forces, you got to be really careful because, man, if they're satanic forces, you're opening yourself up to a world of problems. Yeah, Brother Martin. And I will say, I, I don't think it's, it's because Christ has, I mean, Jesus has a, a mercy on them. I believe it. Yeah, it. It just. It was not. A, it's not the time for him to send him okay. to to the door. And uh, and so he didn't because he. It wasn't their time. Because okay. even okay. even in Jude, I'm reading another verse that says. Yeah. Uh, that is one six that says, and the angel who did not did not stay within their own position or authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept kept in kept in eternal chains until glooming darkness until the uh judgment of of the great day okay every, every, everything is in god's timing hey, amen amen everything is, is so the judgment day and you know the, god and his and his and his and his, and his uh sovereignty allow allow the uh, certain demons to come on on you know and, and basically roam around this earth Right, right, right. Amen. and even Amen. Satan, Satan, as we as we know, but it's going to be come a day and God and, and God's time that they're going to be judged. But those angels that uh, Jude mentioned, they're not here; they are in chain. Yeah, yeah. Amen. And, and, and some of them, is, yeah. if, if if we could see there that even the demons they recognize Christ, right? They Amen. first of they recognize him, and 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 the other thing is they recognize his authority. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, hey, it's great. I mean, no, thank you for that, Brother Martin. So, listen, and they begged him to command them not to depart into the abyss. Now, a large herd of pigs was feeding there on a hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. Now, notice, they beg him. In other words, they know Jesus has the authority to do whatever he's going to do. So, look what Jesus does. He gives them permission. Okay, it says, yeah, go ahead. You can go into those unclean pigs. And so then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herds rushed down, the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. Now, the issue is, you know that basically those demons are still available for others, right? It's not like a demon can die. So that, in essence, basically, like you said, Martin, I guess, uh, what it comes down to is that Jesus is saying, your time's coming, guys. You might have, here, here you go. Just get out of this man, though. Leave him alone. And so they had, he had, they had to come out of him. So, so we see that God relieves this man through Jesus Christ, right? Now, notice that there were herdsmen taking care of all this bacon and, and you know, uh, all, all these uh, pork chops and everything. So all their pork chocks and bacon are gone now. So when the herdsmen, so now think about this. These herdsmen are Gentiles. They've not experienced any of this kind of thing. But think about it. 
these people know a different different gods, okay? But now they're seeing a God-given power, something they've never witnessed before. They expect that the gods they worship have power, but they've never seen any of their gods do anything. But now Jesus has come, and they have just witnessed this. These are Gentiles. Now remember that. So when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Notice how quick the word is getting out about Jesus in this Gentile area. This is all Gentile area. Keep that in mind. Then people went out to see what had happened. And they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. And what were they? They were afraid. Does it sound like his disciples in the boat? In a sense, you know, they're odd. See, they know their gods, okay? And now, all of a sudden, here is somebody that comes in that puts their gods to shame for all intents and purposes and has a power that is over their gods. So can you see why they would be afraid? Because all of a sudden, everything that they believe in has been rattled because of what Jesus has done here, something they've never seen their gods do. And so they're afraid from a godly perspective, a small G perspective, because now they've seen the big G God do an amazing thing. And the people have witnessed it. It's not just hearsay. It was witnessed. So look at verse 36. And those who had seen it told, told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country, the garrisons, asked, him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. Now, my explanation of why they are afraid is exactly the one. They see him as a threat to their gods. And that's why they're asking him to leave, because right now their hearts are not in such a way to, their, to where they're being drawn to saving grace. They're afraid. Remember, Jesus hasn't done anything in terms of teaching them. It was just strictly this one freeing event of this demon-possessed man that now is what circulated, and they're afraid of Jesus big time. They see his mighty power, and they know that their gods would never be able to stand up against Jesus. Not with what he's demonstrated here. That's why they want him gone. Yeah, Brother Martin. And it shows that everything is under God's sovereignty. Amen. You know, they, they could have said, oh, let's kill Jesus, right? Or <laughs> they did try to do that. No. Nope. It doesn't say that. No. Nope. Because you know what? It's, it's, it, everything is in God's timing. Amen. And instead, they are afraid. Amen. They're afraid of, of the power of God and, and what, what, you know, what, what Christ is able to do. Amen. So, so nothing happened to Christ until it was, it was God's timing. Yeah, you know, there were times they're trying to seize him, we just escaped. Amen. You know what I mean? Because they couldn't touch him. Amen. Yeah. And, and in a sense, as a Christian, also, you know, we, death is the one basically we fear, right? Amen. But as a Christian, we are immortal until God's time. Amen. That, you know, death doesn't have power over God. No? Amen. <laughs> death is going to come to us. When God's allowed up, that, that you know, death to come to us right. until until our then, physical, our physical, and our your physical bodies. body, yeah. right? Yeah. Until then, we are immortal in a sense. Amen. Yes, we're gonna get sick. Yes, we're gonna go through a lot of things, but everything's gonna it's gonna happen in God's timing. And that's Amen. Amen. No, in terms of what you're saying, Brother Martin, we are eternal beings already. When we were saved by Jesus Christ, we became eternal. Not this body, not this fallen body, but the body that we will have and our spirit, our soul is permanent. It is forever with the Lord. I mean, that kind of thing, you know, so yeah. it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, Brother Mark. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, human beings are eternal, regardless regardless oh. of, of if they are yeah, uh, safe or not safe, because That's we right. are all made in God's image. Amen. Well, the question is, where are we going to uh, find eternity? Amen. But Amen. those who deny God, they're still eternal. Amen. It's like, Amen. it's like someone said, if you want to, you want to invest in eternity, there's two things you can invest: the word of God 
Amen. Right? Which is Amen. eternal. And human. Humans Amen. are eternal. Amen. So God is awesome. So we see that these people, obviously. Yeah, Martin, you have something else? Sorry, that was a mistake. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we see that these people are concerned, right? Because they already have their views of the spiritual realm. And Jesus has busted that all up for them. Okay, so they want him gone so that they can get back to normal, but not a good normal, but normal. But now notice this in verse 38, and I think this is awesome. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. In other words, he wanted to be a disciple of Jesus, right? But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. What has he just done? He's commissioned this man to be a missionary for him. Just go tell what Jesus Christ has done for you. Boy, isn't that amazing? Because now this guy has a big ministry, doesn't he? Because he's going to that whole Decapolis. That's all Gentile area. And Jesus is saying, hey, you know, yeah, you could follow me. But just, hey, it's better that you go to them. Go tell them what Jesus the Christ has done for you man but notice what he does does he bum out and say well wait a minute oh come on no and he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much jesus had done for him boy that is an amazing yeah go ahead brother martin which is a lesson for us Amen. right how can a person that had their heart transformed by christ stay quiet Amen. how can a person be remain the same it's Amen. impossible because you have to proclaim this, yes, like the, this, this gentleman did, what Christ has done for us. Amen. Okay, maybe we not, we not, we were not demon possessed, right? In a sense, right. okay, right. but we, uh, we were uh, going, we went, we went straight. We were going the, uh, yeah, that has changed our way, which is that's repentance means changing Amen. direction. And how can we cannot tell other people? Look, you know, you can believe wherever you want, but Christ has changed my heart. Amen. You know, I, I have been redeemed. Amen. So this this is it's the same thing, basically, that what we proclaim. Our, yeah. our heart has been redeemed by Christ. Therefore, we proclaim the, the good news. Hallelujah. Praise God. And I'll tell you, this guy, and I'll tell you, it seemed like the people that got the most about Jesus were Gentiles. They're the ones that got Jesus the most, understood him better than most of the Jews. You know, the ones Jesus said, I have not seen so much faith in all of Israel, you know, like to the lady, the Syrophoenician lady, or to, you know, the uh, centurion who wanted his servant healed. Remember, they were Gentiles. And but yet Jesus said, now those people had faith. And that's what he we see also in this guy. He actually said, yeah, this is what I want to go tell the people that, hey, this Jesus came and boy you know me you know i'm that guy that was crazy and going in the tombs and stuff but hey he healed and freed me wow what a testimony huh and so he went out and boldly went and proclaimed i tell you what i think he turned that whole place upside down for lord jesus christ you know that but this is the last we hear of him. But it's amazing. I like that Luke brought that up, put that story in there because I think it's important. I mean, we know there's another gospel that talks about it, and they talk about two that were demon possessed, but it's believed to be the same one. But in this case, it's focusing on this one guy. Luke, for some reason, focused on this main guy. Yeah, go ahead, Brother Mark. And how can those people deny what has been done to him? Oh, hey, amen. I'm, I'm sure most of the people knew about right. him because at that time there were not so many people in that region, probably. Right. So, so people knew about this guy. Yeah. So it's oh, not yeah. like saying, "Oh, what you're saying is false." You, you can't deny it because basically it's keeping witness. I used to be possessed. Now I, I'm liberated. Look what Christ has done for me. How can you? How can you context that that argument? Right. <laughs> you don't have to believe it, but he's saying, "Look, this is what happened to me." Amen. Amen. So I mean, hey. When you look at what God does, I mean, he does an amazing things. And Jesus just totally set the standard and the, and the wonder of it all, you know, through what he did in his ministry. And I'll tell you, hey, we are called to be more Christ-like, to follow Christ, to be more like Jesus, right? Isn't that what Romans 8 says, that the, 
what the Father wants of us is that we all would be conformed more to the image of his son. We need to look more like Jesus every day. And I'll tell you, it is by going and telling others that we would look more like Jesus every day as we reflect Jesus and tell others about Jesus in the process. So that's our calling. So we need to be active in, you know, we need to be active telling others the good news. Anyway, that's our lesson for this evening. Any final questions, comments, agreements, disagreements, corrections, anything else that you need some maybe uh, understanding about or something? Do we have any idea where the demons went after the pigs drowned? Well, um, one of the things, if you look at like um, in Daniel, remember when Daniel uh, had made a prayer to God? I think it's around chapter 11, uh, that there uh, God sent an angel to come and deliver a message to Daniel. And this angel got held up because of like a demon of the air that was over Greece or Persia or something. And they were struggling. They were fighting and he wasn't letting them get through. So Michael, the archangel, came and was able to take over the fight. And then the angel was able to come and deliver the message to Daniel. The reason I bring up that story is because they can exist outside of beings. But just mm -hmm. because the, the being dies, whether it's whatever creature they are possessing dies, they still live on. They can still be functional. And gotcha. yeah. No, I was just acknowledging saying, okay. Oh, yeah. And so they can be dri driven out just like Jesus did. But remember the other one, uh, the other story that Jesus told, you know, that, uh, you know, a person can be swept clean, but then the daemon will go out and find seven others worse than that one and bring them in and repossess yes. the person. So yes. the, the, you've got to remember these, they, they are not corporeal beings, they're spirit beings. So they have the ability to go out there and do things, but we, that's why we need to have the spirit of God in us, because when the Holy Spirit resides in us, no other spirit can come in. Like a, a, a satanic spirit can never come in and dwell in a person that has the Holy Spirit in. Them. And, and, and Ted, we have yeah. to remember that the Bible says that the prince of this world is Satan. Amen. So, 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 so this war is by influence, basically, the system of this world. That's being right. influenced by the devil and his demons. Absolutely. And, and even though they, 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 they you know, they're not be possessed, they may not be possessed, but they are being influenced. Oh, absolutely. Or oppressed. Yeah. Right. And be oh, oppressed. oppressed which, which we as a Christian, we can be oppressed. That's right. The one thing we have to remember, we cannot be possessed, but right. we could be oppressed. Amen. So, so you, you'd be surprised out there you, if you, you encounter some antagonistic attitude it might be someone being, uh, how you call it, <laughs> direct by a demon. You know what I mean? Yeah, through their oppression, oppression they're being kind of yeah, led yeah. in that way. Yes, yeah. led because that is that is the 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 uh, the job of the enemy. And remember, they see us as enemy of of of, of them. Oh yeah, because we 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 have the Holy Spirit. We oh, we, we represent. So that, like like you mentioned, this they don't have, they don't have to be. Uh, they don't have to incorporate in the body to do things. Right. They, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the, in the occult that we don't even know. Oh, but going back to, uh, to uh, the uh, proclaiming the gospel, we just got to remember that it's our job to to tell the people the gospel. Amen. Just exactly like, you know, because we, we all being set free, right? Amen. So we it's, it's our job to tell other people Absolutely. what Christ has done for us in presenting the gospel. Someone said that, you know, uh, our testimony it's not the gospel by the way right. it's, it could be presented but it's not it's not the gospel well, our job is to present the gospel but we all have our own testimony amen well they and work our, together our responsibility yeah. by the way yeah. it's a command amen amen absolutely so there's spiritual warfare going on all around us we just don't see it can't see it oh yeah exactly as a matter of fact, hold on, let me just bring up Ephesians 6 real quick, and I'll show you what we're talking about here. Because, I mean, it's, I mean, ever since the Lord God kicked the, the angels out of heaven, along with Satan, I mean, they landed here on earth. 
I mean, that's and that's where their function, that's where their area has been. Um, so let me see here. Hang on just a second. Uh, OK, look, listen to what he says in verse 10 and following of Ephesians 6. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And his might is the Holy Spirit in us. OK, it's his strength. Right. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Look what we stand against against the schemes of the devil he's the prince of the power of the air right and his, he uses his minions in that in that way it says for we do not fight against flesh uh, a wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers now these are we're talking about the evil ones rulers against the authorities against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now, so he's talking about, now the heavenly places doesn't mean they're only out there in heaven. No, they're talking about like the second heaven. They're they're in the world, but the first and second heaven, they're up in this area, and that's where they inhabit. It's probably the first heaven, actually, because it's from like uh, just above the earth to up in the sky, so to speak. That's the second heaven, or I mean the first heaven. So that's where they reside. That's where the forces of evil reside in these heavenly places. They're effective against this world, just as Brother Martin is saying. I mean, the, Satan uses them to manipulate this world toward those issues of the flesh. That's why the flesh is a problem. That's why Galatians 5 says we need to put this flesh to death, that if, you know, that mm -hmm. we are have an ongoing battle between the flesh and the spirit. And if we walk by the spirit, then we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. So it's it's the struggle that's ongoing. And that's why then Paul talks about putting on the armor of God that is supposed to help us. And he says, hold up your shield of faith, which you with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. So in other words, Satan's active. He is out there. I mean, to say, oh, no, nah, he that's just movie stuff. No, baloney. Satan is active out there, and we need to be strong against those forces because they are active. And like Martin said, it could be oppression. It can be other ways. Although he can't possess a, a believer in Christ, he can put things in our path that can definitely make us deviate and do things that we would otherwise not normally do because of the flesh. The flesh is the problem. And, and, and if you look at the things that's going on in this world, Everything that all those laws that are passed again against God a commandment. Right. Listen, I mean, I understand this that human beings are responsible for their action. Yes, they are. But at the same time, all those people are being influenced by the enemy. Amen. Amen. You know, killing babies. You know what's to kill human beings? Yeah. Well, who's who's not enemy number one? It's the devil. So does Amen. he want children to live? No, because they're they are they are making God's image. Amen. So what is the lie that have been uh promoted out there? You you in control of your body, you could do as you please. Right. And it's going back to the uh to the lie or that he told uh Adam and, and Eve. Yeah, amen. It's the same thing. And yeah. when you look at the other things, all this law that tells a man, oh, you 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 don't you, you know you, you could change now. You God made you a, a man, but guess what? You you could change, you don't have to be that way. Yeah. Where's that <laughs> light comes from? Does it does it come from God? No, right. Right. God forbid. You Amen. know, it comes from the enemy. Amen. Yeah, I'll tell you, Satan's got lies out there, and it's amazing how many people get hooked you know, with those lies and think that, yeah, that's exactly what I'm supposed to do or who I'm supposed to be. It's, yeah. The same thing with, with drugs. Hey, you, 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 you're you not content? Well, take, take, take some opioid, whatever it's called. Right. There, I don't know, the cocaine, yeah. you know, it's going to make you happy. And guess what? <laughs> Again, it's going back to the lie. Just Amen. taste a little bit. And guess what? After that, what happens? You're hooked for life. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you, Satan's the father of lies. Jesus said that even when he speaks, he only speaks lies because that's who he is. And he used different tools, right? Yeah, absolutely. It could be drugs, it could be sex, it could be anything. Yeah, anything, anything out there that is against yeah. the Lord. Yeah. Because again, the prince of this world, the Bible says, is the devil. Amen. System this world. Any other questions, comments, agreements, disagreements?
So, yeah, just be aware. Hey, spiritual warfare is real today. Don't think that that was just back in Jesus' day or maybe even, you know, just a little around that time. No, Satan is still quite active out there today. And so we need to be alert. And we need, just like Jesus said in Matthew 24, we need to be alert and we need to be ready because these things are real as we get closer and closer to the end. Well, it's going to Satan's going to ramp up more. I mean, that's what the prophecies tell us. Satan's going to ramp up more and things are going to get crazier between now and the time of the end. And we need to remember that we are not from this world. Amen. We belong to a different kingdom. We are just passing by. Amen. Amen. OK, good. Amen. Oh, OK, let's get into prayer time then. Let me stop the recording.